Thomas als Kettigo. Okay, thanks everybody again for joining us here at the Vichy PE podcast. Today we're joined by former Team GB gymnast and Scottish gymnast Dan Purvis. Hello Dan. Hi, yeah, uh, you're right, thank Hi, you. Hey. Dan. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, as ever, we're joined by Mr. McHugh. Right, Mr. McHugh. That's number 25 this week. Number 25. Excellent. Number 25, so we're, we're flying. Yeah, and also joined by a uh, National 5 and S4 people, Jade McCletchie. Hello, Jade. Hi. Hi, how are you? Not too bad. Excellent. Um, so, Dan, I'm just going to start us off today, and I'm going to ask you the first question just about your school career. Um, so, how did you find your school career, and did you stay on until uh, 16, or did you stay on uh, ahead of that? Yeah, so school, it does feel a long time ago now. I'm uh, 10 and 30 next month, so looking back at my school years, uh, <laughs> it's quite a scary thought. But yeah, school, it was, um, it was a bit of a challenge in the sense that I was training from about year five. I know it's a bit different in England and Scotland, but yeah, about year five, so it would have been about uh, nine and ten. Um, yeah. I was doing about nine hours in the week. So I'd finish school in primary school and then I would go to training. Um, yeah. So for, for little boys to do that and, and little girls, it's quite hard, you know, to, to manage that. But you get used to it. And um, then moving into secondary school, the hours increased. So I was doing about 20, 20 plus hours in the week. So almost a full-time job, also balancing school. But it was great. School was a great escape for me. You know, yeah. in that it can be quite stressful training almost every evening. You know, sometimes things don't go right. And then to go into school and see your friends and and have a chat and just distract your head and I know from my mum and dad are school teacher, so education is very important for us so yeah try to do the best in school and also you know try and balance uh, the sport that I love to do yeah um, did you have a particularly favorite subject in school favorite subject I really enjoyed English that was good yeah uh, and PE lovely I just loved, loved, loved all that sort of things and, and the challenges that come with it you know uh, Gymnastics I do love, but just playing footy, you know, being from Liverpool as well, football is a massive thing, so, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> everyone is having a kick about in, a, in the PSS, was great. Yeah, Jane, I think you've got a question on kind of balance in school and training, haven't you? Yeah, so, like, how did you manage to balance, like, your school, um, like, work, you get, like, homework and studying along with, like, so many hours a week? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, for me, I'll try and get it done as soon as I got home. I had an hour to, to get some food after school and, and to do some homework. So I normally try to do it there. Um, it, it wasn't easy, but it is possible. And then the time I got home would be about 8.30, So I'd want to go straight to bed, get ready for school the next day as it was a, an early start. So just trying to fit it in just before I went, uh, went training. See, yeah. uh, just moving on to the next question, Dan, like... You spoke about time at school and then obviously training, but did you have any part-time jobs perhaps going to help you further down the line? Um, I didn't have any part-time jobs, but looking back on it, I'm, I'm a gymnastic coach now, and um, I certainly could have done some recreational coaching on top of, of training. Um, yeah. I think my mindset was certainly concentrate on school and concentrate on gymnastics, um, because if, if gymnastics went wrong, I really needed you know, an education to fall back on, certainly. Um, but yeah, I certainly could have got a bit of pocket money doing some coaching on the side and, and got my levels. I mean, I when I was about 25 when I had to get my level one and two co coaching qualifications to want to run my own gymnastic business. If I have got there when I was younger, it would have made things, you know, a bit easier in, in the future. But it's all in hindsight, so certainly recommend doing anything like that. And, um, especially being a gymnast, doing any sort of gymnastic coaching, giving back to little ones, I think, uh, is really good and can also help you progress in, in, in your own career. I think. Yeah. Jane, have you got any part time jobs? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> you, need to get, you need to get your part time job, you paper round or something like that. <laughs> um, Dan, could you tell us um, how the gymnastics came about? Can you your, your journey into it? Yeah, so basically I started gymnastics because I was uh, 
I was pretty rubbish at football, if I'm honest. Uh, Preston Hogby knows what that's like. <laughs> and being in Liverpool, it's a big, uh, it's a really big sport, football. Everyone was doing it. All my friends were doing football. Um, and my older brother, he's about three years older than me. He was playing for under 14 Everton. Um, oh, yeah. Everton Football Club. So he was really good. So I wanted to try and be like him as such. Um, but I certainly could not kick a ball, you know, going in the wrong net. I couldn't follow the rules, but... I was running around celebrating without scoring, doing cartwheels, things like that, without knowing what exactly gymnastics was. So a PE teacher recommended going to a local gymnastics club uh, to my parents, and then they put me in there, and then that's how I got started, really. And after a year, after probably about half a year in recreational gymnastics, he um, saw some potential and put me into a competitive squad. That's how I got started. Dan, just before we put it the obviously in Scousa, how did the team thought him? Like, um, yeah, so uh, the team Scotland, it was uh, it was really great how it happened. There's um, an ex gymnast as well called Daniel Peters, who was at the 2014 Commonwealth Games, he's done at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, and he trained team Scotland before me. And we got on really well. He trained in Huntington, so near London, so you know, born in England, but he had a uh, Scottish grandparents, nice. so. He said how much of how great it was going to the training camps in Scotland and traveling the world. And, and at the time, I, my, um, I was doing some competitions, but I wasn't doing things like Commonwealth Games and, you know, major things like that. So I thought, well, you know, I love going to Scotland. I've got a lot of family from Dundee. Um, my mum was uh, very Scottish, being born in Dundee. And um, that's, that's just where, where I got inspired to do it, really. You know, one of my best friends, Dan Keaton, was on the team. He was telling me how good it was. And, yeah, it was honestly, looking back at my career, probably certainly one of the greatest decisions I could have made to join Team Scotland as, a, as an early age. I think I was about 14 when I joined. So, yeah, it was yeah. A, a great decision to make. Yeah. You, you've spoken there, Dan, about how, how you've um, achieved medals at kind of Olympic, Commonwealth, World and kind of European Games. What's your professional career been like? It's um, it's, it's if I had to describe it, it's been like a roller coaster. Certainly, it's uh, it, it's the greatest thing I could have done. But there's been times where I thought to myself, man, uh, this is this is very tough. And um, you know, I've had to describe it. It would be like a roller coaster. You know, it started out as a high doing gymnastics, um, and then trying to make the squads and getting on the TV squads when I was about eleven. So that was a high. But then also being told that in some some events that you're not good enough and you're not going to make the team so that's a low and then injuries and, and all that sort of thing but uh, as a whole it's been fantastic but certainly it's just made me the person that I am today you know um, in the fact that I was I was quite shy when I was younger um, and gymnastics gave me something that I felt good about which, which, which is great like I mentioned before football was a massive sport especially in in all worldwide, but in Liverpool, the culture is huge and there wasn't many gymnasts, especially boy gymnasts. So to be able to go into school and do a backflip was uh, was great. And then they go, oh, there's Danny, the ginger gymnast. Uh, and it would give me, you know, um, respect in myself. And then I could take that and feel feel really positive about myself. So, yeah, I think it was certainly the greatest thing I could have done. And um, looking back at it, I'd, no matter how tough it's been, I'll, I'll, all the sacrifices, I'll say it do it again to really just to give me something that I thought I'm really good about it myself and, and carry that on. Yeah. Brilliant. Jake, over to you. Um, what would you say is the best part about being involved in gymnastics? Um, great question. I think um, for me, I think the best part is is probably the sociable aspect in the sense that you know you have some of my best friends are still is still gymnasts or ex gymnasts and. Really, I think the sport's amazing. It, it can teach you so many things about yourself because it's a tough sport. Uh, but as a team, as a group, you might be in a group of seven or eight. You're all working together to achieve a certain skill or try and push each other. Uh, or conditioning, you know, conditioning or doing the splits. You know, it, it can be tough. It can be, can be painful. But everyone goes through that together. Uh, it can really create a strong bond. So I'll certainly see the social aspect and. Also, like I mentioned before, give me some sort of strong identity. For me, I uh, I was proud to then say I'm a gymnast and I represent my country. You know, that was great. And when I was younger as well, I think times have changed now, but it used to be a bit of known as a daily sport. The boys would have to wear leotards and, you know, 
people don't really quite understand that. But when you can come in and do a backflip or, you know, you can do the most press up to the class and people take notice of that. I think, uh, yeah, I think it gives you a certain pride and there's not many sports like gymnastics where you can, uh, you can showcase that. And uh, yeah, and, it, and, it, and it, it's very different. So quite a few things, but certainly I would say the social aspect working together and uh, making sure we bonds and friends through, uh, through all the hard experiences in the sport. Dan, did you find that a bit of a challenge? Like you said, previously it's been known as a girly sport. Did you find that a bit of a challenge going in to the school in Liverpool, which is a predominantly football area? Mm. Yeah, I think I did. I mean, a lot of things when I was younger just went straight over my head, to be honest. It was, a, yeah, I was just being a gymnast and that was it. But I think I remember certainly in, in a primary school, there was a talent show. And I remember I came in in my leotard and shorts. And uh, I remember there was a couple of sniggers and that. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I didn't feel bad about myself because then I just did my thing. You know, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to do the splits and the backflips and all that. And then, I, and then it was great. But yeah, um, before it, I was quite nervous doing that, you know, wearing that. But after it, you know, mm -hmm. we used to raise it. And uh, yeah, so certainly there was that. But I think as well, again, like I said before, it was different. It was different in football and things like that. So I think when people realised that and can realise, wow, this guy or you know, other gymnasts could do handstands and stuff, that, that's cool. And once people started to say that was cool, then I felt a lot more comfortable about, uh, yes, yeah, saying I was a gymnast. So. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. You touched on a couple of your, your successes there in your career. What would you say is a particular highlight, uh, perhaps even one of few highlights of your master's career? Uh, to, to be honest, I've been really fortunate. So there's just been so many. Um, I think certainly my, my biggest highlight would be London Olympic 2012. That was, uh, that was incredible. That was really a dream come true. But really, it was a dream come true from... Not really. <clears throat> Obviously, had expectation, but the main thing was to go to the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. But to come away with a team medal was, yeah. was honestly just unbelievable. And it was really down to our team set up. You know, there was five of us in the team. There was Lewis Smith, Sam Olden, Christian Thomas, and Max Whitlock, uh, and myself. And uh, we just went out there and just said, like, it's qualified. It's the first time Great Britain have ever qualified a team for the, for the team Olympic final. Let's just enjoy it. Um, and as the competition progressed, it uh, a lot more nerve wracking, um, knowing there was a medal on board. But then all of us just having that same mentality throughout the competition and support each other, and then just standing there with five closest friends and teammates, it was a uh, you know, really proud moment. And to be in London as well, I mean, the hype in London town was, was unbelievable. Um, and then I had my family there, my, my coaches there. It was uh, really special. So, yeah, something like that, you know, I always got back on it. So happy about it. And it made everything worth it. And then also going on from two years from there was uh, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, which was such a similar feeling. And uh, of course, in Glasgow, I don't know if you guys managed to go to any of the events, but it was unbelievable. Anyway, I actually, I ended up at the weightlifting. I don't know if really? I was at the weightlifting. It was won the, the, the medals. Like, I went to watch gymnastics ah, in the 2014. Oh, wow. I probably saw you there. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so it was a and the Hydro Arena. What a fantastic arena that is. And ah, it's very big if you the of the London Olympics. You know, it was a home game, a lot of expectation, but people were just happy to watch sport. And I, I really do think the generations were inspired from seeing these, these home games. So... Yeah, that was that was another major one, and we got our first team silver medal for for Team Scotland there at the Commonwealth Games. So very proud of that, and it was five uh, five of other great teammates. Dr. Daniel Keaton before that mentioned Adam Cox, got a gymnast Frank Baines, who's from Liverpool as well, but he's been one of my uh, teammates throughout the years and trained for me. And we joined Team Scotland, um, yeah, not too far before the Commonwealth Games, and also. I had Liam Davy. He moved away, but he was a great Scottish gymnast as well. So for us all to do that and stand on the podium together was very reminiscent of London 2012. And then on the second, yeah, on the team final, uh, sorry, the individual Paolo Bars final, I managed to get my first Commonwealth Games gold medal on the Paolo Bars. And to listen to the uh, Scottish national anthem, um, I almost welled up to be honest. It was a uh, you know, we're really emotional. I've, I've never really felt that before, to be honest. Maybe it's because it was an individual gold medal. And again, with all the kind of 
not pressure, but kind of expectation going into that, that parallel yeah. box. And everyone being so nice and supportive, it felt like I did everyone proud. So it was nice to, to stand there and, uh, you know, almost like a thank you for uh, everyone's support and to get uh, Scotland a gold medal was, was fantastic. Is there, is there more or less pressure on a team event? Rather than an individual thing that you can control yourself. Mm. It's a it's a strange one really because as much as gymnastics is a team, it does have team events. You almost feel like an individual because you're going up there individually and then coming back down. It's obviously yeah. your skills that all combined, but certainly I always felt more pressure as a team. You know, if the something was to go wrong, yeah, I think everyone else in that kind of feel that way. That you know, it's not so much you letting down, but you, you've made a mistake and. You know, you've got to, the whole team's got to carry that. So, yeah, I mean, it's never good. When, and trust me, I've had a lot of, <laughs> you know, bad competitions in, in my uh, career that you learn from. But certainly, I think the teams have always been more pressure for me because, you know, it's the weight of the team and you show it rather than individual. Yeah. They are slightly different pressures. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I've seen the team more pressure. Well, you, you touched on obviously some of your highlights there, Dan, but everything in life in sport and is there any particular setbacks you've had in your career that have helped you grow and learn from? Oh, certainly, certainly. Especially starting out in my career. Um, you know, I mentioned that I got onto the British squad when I was about 10, but to start to get noticed, there was, a, there was about 20 gymnasts in the country that would be selected for the junior squad uh, that came out of national final. And I certainly, you know, in the national final, maybe got into the top 15. So I certainly had a long way to go. And it, and it took me a long time to get there. Um, so I think, I remember I got injured. I had um, severs on my ankle. I had to go to the training camp. So I had a boot on my ankle. Um, and that held me back for a while. And then I remember I missed a junior selection. Um, they had me as the reserve uh, in Europeans. Um, so that was hard. That was hard. But, you know, I, I've, I've been really lucky. I, you know, my parents have been great. Um, always trying to reinforce that as long as you try hard that's the main thing and my coach is always good at telling me don't worry about the bad things let's just try and smash it for the next competition um, but yeah mentally that was hard and also going to primary school and having all my friends go to parties and things like that that was difficult when I would you know have to go on a Friday night for instance and go to a beach party or something and I'd have to go and, and train um, where's the beach so, parties in Liverpool beach parties <laughs> I know it's not like California; they're a bit cold. <laughs> but I, remember, <laughs> I remember that's where everyone used to go for some reason. Uh, so yeah, that was difficult. But I think everyone, every athlete's got to got that decision to make: which way you're going to go. You're going to dedicate yourself because it has to be dedicated. You're going to try and make it, or you're going to go the other route, which is fine. But it's certainly an individual route. And um, then there was uh, the Rio Olympic selection um, that I was the reserve for in 2016, and. And that was really tough. That took me really quite a while to get over, to be honest, because I felt, personally, I felt like I should have been in that team, but for whatever reason, uh, I wasn't. So um, that was hard. And it took me a while then. And I knew then I wanted to finish on a major. So I aimed for 2018, the Commonwealth Games in Scotland and in Australia. And that really gave me the motivation to, to put the, the guards back on, as you, as you say, and, yeah, to, to have something to, to aim for. And I'm really glad that I did that. You know, I could walk away out of my career now with my head held high rather than, you know, not throwing my teddy out the cut after not being selected for real, but, you know, feeling really hard done by and just thinking I'll walk away now. So I'm glad that I stayed on, but there's certainly been a lot of, lot of lows, but a lot of them lows I've, I've managed to turn into a high, which is uh, something I'm proud of. Yeah. Dan, you've, you've spoken a lot about training. Um, and we certainly know that Jade spends a lot of time training. Uh, mm -hmm. 14 hours a week, you train Jade, is that right? 18-ish. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking to our higher kids, uh, National 5 advanced higher kids, about different types of training. What would your typical kind of week be um, in terms of your training, obviously when you're competing? Yeah, so um, yeah, when I was a senior athlete, so when I when I left school after GCSEs, I, uh, I, was, I was doing about six days a week, so... It would be on a pretty much Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and sometimes a Thursday. Yeah, so, yeah, pretty much every day, to be honest, when I was a senior. Sorry, I'll go back a little bit because I know Jade's in school as well. So if I can relate it like that, Jade, it would be a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 
on a Saturday morning. So it'll be four days a week, and that'll be about three and a half hour sessions. So probably pretty similar to yourself, I imagine. Yeah. Exactly yeah. what. <laughs> yeah. So just trying to find those those hours in in the week, isn't it? Because there's so much to to get done in the gym. Um, yeah. And then yeah, sorry, when I was a I left school, then yeah, it was six days a week training. So I'll get a Sunday off, and uh, pretty much I'll just base it as a full time job, really. Um, yeah. Luckily, I'm getting lottery funded, so I was able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Was that you spend a lot of time in the gym, or was it? Uh, what kind of thing were you doing when you're training? Yeah, to be honest, it was all based in gymnastics, really. So, you know, I'd do an hour of conditioning and stretching, and then it would be on the apparatus. So I would do maybe a 12.30 session to 3.34, and then I'd have yeah. an hour's break, and then I'd do um, maybe six, 5 or 6 o'clock to 8.30 or 9, something like that, um, depending if I got the work done. But I certainly had a program where I had to go in. And I'd yeah. normally try and base the first session with three pieces and the second with three pieces because in men's you have six pieces all together. And in yeah. women's, as you know, JD, you have four. So it was just trying to separate them because obviously, yeah, you can do all the hours in a day, but if you're not resting or you're just, you know, going on the apparatus, it's certainly the quality um, as much as the, the quantity as well, yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you actually do your days off then? I mean, you do all that, Jane. and hours and hours and hours. I don't know if I can be bothered doing anything. <laughs> it was difficult, yeah. I mean, the main thing was uh, was recovery. But again, I, I, I love to see my mates. So, you know, we'll go to cinema, we'll go bowling. We'll do all sorts of things like that. Uh, when I was younger, you know, those sleepovers on a Saturday. So luckily I'd do a Saturday morning and then I'd have the whole rest of the day and a Sunday off. So it worked quite well, really. So you get to the beach. <laughs> Sorry? Get to, get to the, the beach. <laughs> get to the beach parties, yeah. <laughs> there's none of them at the moment sadly but, uh, <laughs> yeah so yeah the, the actual training was pretty much Monday to Saturday and then I uh, almost get kind of a full weekend off but just seeing mates and taking my mind off it was so important probably yeah. you know similar Jade when you know you get quite a few mental blocks when you just keep trying to do something and sometimes you just need that break away and, and seeing friends and other perspectives and then having a fresh mindset for the next week so yeah Jade do you have the next question? Um, how important was nutrition during your training career and how did you, like like you mentioned, only getting like an hour off, how did you balance eating and training like within it? Yeah, no, it's a re really good question again there. Um, I think for me, nutrition really, I started to take more notice of when I, when I was starting to leave school and metabolism was, uh, was not as fast, I guess. And, you know, I... I could have like a can of Coke and a chocolate bar before training when I was younger, you know, and I, I didn't realize that wasn't the fuel that I needed, but you know, I'd have it just thinking, Oh, I need energy. I need something quick after school. And it was already affected. I could do four hours fine. And then it was only when I got older, I realized, man, I'm, I'm feeling a bit sluggish today. I'm slowing down. Okay. I really need to get my nutrition in. And uh, luckily we had a nutritionist in a uh, British gymnastics. So on training camps, there would be set meals for us. So we would have a healthy breakfast, healthy lunch, and then a, a healthy dinner so there's three meals prepared but then at home I had to take on so that luckily my mum and dad were pretty good chefs so they used to uh, prepare some healthy meals for me um, especially breakfast was really important you know before school I try and have something like wheat or bix without the sugar maybe some honey on it instead and uh, maybe I had to change brown bread sorry from white bread to brown bread that was a that was a hard change at first <laughs> certainly beneficial um, noodles and sausages though Oh, I do love I do love a sausage butty, but I, I had to try and cut all that out, especially the older I got. It was a, a case of um, poached eggs or scrambled eggs on, on brown toast. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because if a gym, gymnastics as well, I, I, when I was doing it full time as a senior athlete, I wanted to be as light as I could, but with energy. So going in and a fry up, sitting on your belly, doing handstands and stuff, be like, oh, can't do that. So something um, quick and easy, poached eggs, some green tea and maybe maybe a smoothie, things like that. But. The challenging thing was is when I was going around the world doing um, world championships or, or World Cup games. So it would be like the top eight gymnasts in the world to do a, a certain competition, but it would be in four locations. So it would be Germany, Japan, America, and uh, it was normally in Glasgow as well. Um, so the problem with that is when you're in airports and things, how do you get that in? So uh, the nutritionist recommended getting smoothies in, things like that, and um, mm -hmm. maybe not eating the plain food, maybe taking you know, a, a packed lunch or stuff. If you can try and make yeah. one before you get to your flight. Things like that. So these are challenges that I had, but obviously, yeah, nutrition is so important. And I think 
the way um, education is now, it, it, it's it's so much better to to understand it and to know that you know you need every every one percent counts and yeah. uh, you get that for your, for your nutrition. It's uh, certainly important. So the older I got, the more I realised how important it was. And yeah, hopefully by the end near the back end of my career, I was there. Uh, yeah, pretty eating pretty healthily and uh, recovering healthily as well. Right. Right. Uh, my next question is in relation to obviously performing. We speak to our higher kids about managing their emotion. Now you need to deal with the pressure of, of performing in front of large crowds at the Olympics and at the Commonwealth Games. Did you have any buzzwords or routines that you went through that sort of helped you prior to your performance? Mm. Um, what sort of the routine? I mean, I, I, I think every gymnast does, but you can only know it from your personal self. I used to get really nervous. And like really like hard, find it hard to sleep and things, especially when I was a junior. And uh, you know there is quite a lot of pressure if you want to try and get onto the British squad. So you got a national final, and uh, you need to come in the top twenty, and there's fifty other gymnasts. You know things like that. It it was difficult. You know I had great co- a great coach Jeff Brooks. Um, so he used to tell me like you just need to go for it. Just try and you know take everything out of your mind as such. But it's only when I got older you can only really kind of develop that yourself. So. Um, I remember I had a couple of bad junior competitions and uh, it was certainly all because of, of the nerves and it was frustrating because the training into it would be really good. So I'll be doing really well and then I go to the competition and it would, you know, won't be as good. Um, so I did have to take a step back and think, well, you know, I could do all this training, but if I'm not mentally strong enough to perform and put my hand up um, under pressure, then, you know, it's going to be for, for nothing really. So for me, I just came up with my own techniques which was before, as I present my routine, take a big deep breath in and relax. And straight away that would calm everything down, calm my body down, mm-hmm. kind of reset and then go for it. Um, also, I think towards the end, sorry, towards the Olympic Games and things like that, when gymnastics getting certainly a lot popular and the Commonwealth Games, coming off social media really helped me. Um, yes. It's amazing to see how much people support you, but this also comes that expectation. Uh, expectation. I remember yeah. before the Olympics and stuff, there'll be people from, from school I haven't heard from in a while, like messaging me going, oh, I can't wait to see you on TV and stuff. And it's like, oh, my days. You don't know, look for tickets, Dan. No, I don't look for tickets to any of the events. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that happens. Uh, they'll bark up the wrong tree there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so coming on social media before, big championships like that, that helped me. And just yeah. trying to stay in my own bubble, keep it as small as possible. Mm. And try and, um, you know, some of my best routines are in training. Like a, like a lot of gymnasts so I'm trying to keep a similar bubble and uh, yeah it's not all obviously there's pressure but not I didn't try and put too much pressure on myself you know I always tried to have that mentality of easy going give it my best and, uh, and see what happens I think the worst thing you can do is, is put more added pressure on yourself mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know I used to think to myself okay go into this competition if I mess up it's just going to be a learning curve and then we'll move on um, it's, it's not a life and death situation that type of thing but Again, the breathing was, was very important. And uh, when I've looked into it as well, I think, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's been a lot of things to breathing that can really calm me down under, under high-pressure situations. Yeah. Right. Ed, I think I have partly yeah. asked a question there, so you, you might want to reword that. Aye, right, well, Dan, I've got, a, I've got a kind of side question here for you. Um, just to, speaking earlier on about all the different places you've, you've been to and competed, um, see if you were to pick one, what, where would it be in terms of your favourite? Favourite? Um, to be honest, I can't, like, Glasgow and London were just on equal parts to me. It was yeah. absolutely incredible. Um, everything, like I mentioned before, the support, the atmosphere, and you can just feel the buzz of, of any home game. So, yeah. I guess, excluding like, them two situations, I would say Japan. I, uh, yeah. I loved going to Japan. It was incredible. And gymnastics over there is, uh, is geared as one of their top-level sports. So, when I went to uh, the 2011 Japanese World Championships, it, it was just amazing. And uh, it, was, it was amazing that, like, that people understood what gymnastics was. So it wasn't like, oh, you were on TV. It was like, oh, you, uh, you perform really well on this apparatus and stuff. So they knew kind of what, what went into it. So that was really special. And uh, also one of my role models and idols, Koei Ichimura, he's been like six-time world champion, two-time Olympic all-round champion. He, um, he, he was uh, born in Japan. And uh, just to train with them, we did training camps in Japan and just to watch them and how, especially him, how he trains and how he competes was, was really special and made, really made a lot. Um, putting my senior 
competitive career together, uh, just watching him and how he trains. And um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been really lucky, but I think Japan was certainly the one that stood out to me the most. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you know, you've got your own coaching company, is that right, Dan? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I started, um, yeah, Dan Perry Gymnastics um, in 2016, the back end of 2016, yep. and it's doing recreational gymnastics, and it's been running now for, yeah, four years. So um, still quite a, a small, small, um, not small level, but smaller capacity that I don't have my own gymnastics centre. So doing it in leisure centres, and I've just moved in to a school as well. So yeah, I'd love to build it up one day, but it's been a, yeah, it's a really great, really great truth, and, and I've loved it. What's, what's going on there, Racking? You performing or watching your gymnast perform? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, to be honest, I haven't done too much competitive. I do coach competitively, but I haven't had too many uh, gymnasts doing competitive competitions. But I imagine not having the control and my coach, Jeff, and um, my Jeff used to say it all the time, you know, he, he hated just watching con control anything. Um, but certainly... When I was, if I had to look at it from a, a teammate point of view, it was harder probably watching my teammate on the apparatus than me doing it, <laughs> I think, because uh, you've got no control. And I think that's just uh, human nature, really. So I imagine, yeah, if I've got, um, in the future, if I've, I've got a high-level gymnast and I'm watching them, I'll probably be more <laughs> nervous, I imagine. Yeah. Dan, I've just, I've just got a, a kind of question that I've written down earlier. So how hard is it to mentally prepare for something such as the Olympics or the Commonwealth Games that are four years away mm. is it another yeah. work some sort of cycles yeah it was a it was a massive change the way I thought about it um obviously I like I did my first world championship 2010 and then it was 2012 where I did the first Olympics and it was the f obviously I was so nervous for the world championships and um I learned a lot from it um but then to two years later to go to the Olympics it was totally a different level and uh, I, I just thought to myself you know this is going to be the same group of gymnasts the ones that I've been competing against for the last two years now. Uh, and it was that, of course, but it was all the other sports that were, were in it as well, like the multi-sport games and that Commonwealth Games as well. It, uh, yeah, that, would, that, would, that took a little while to adjust to, seeing athletes off TV, seeing, um, you know, it, the net, seeing everyone gets more involved with it. You know, like I mentioned before, people messaging and social media and stuff like that. Um, so I had to adjust to that level. Also... When you're at a multi-sport event, the food there could be different. So you can literally get whatever you want. In Olympics, there was a McDonald's. And I mean, the first week, there was no one there. The second week, everyone was there after their performances, you know, relaxing. Like, so it's so easy. So you, you do have to have like, quite a strict discipline. Again, staying in your own bubble, understanding what's going to get the best out of your body. Um, so these were all learning curves, but I was still young. I was 21 when I went to 2012. So... Yeah, luckily gymnastics was in the first week, so I could enjoy the McDonald's after that. But yeah, it was uh, going to the Commonwealth Games, next multi sport event. That was great to have the experience of London. So yeah, um, it's certainly, yeah, it's, it, was, it was harder. It was harder to, probably more nerve wracking, like you say, because you only get one chance as well. You know, yeah, okay, World Championships, you get one chance, but you could do it the next year. Hopefully, you make the team. At Olympics or Commonwealth Games, you know, it's every four years. And, um, you know, I really feel out there for the for any athlete now that I've missed out on this year's yeah. Games. And maybe the, this was, you know, the, the last one that I thought he could afford to do. So, you know, some people give opportunities for, some people not. But, yeah, you, it's a lot more calculated. You know, you really have to think a long game, long term in, in a sport where you, if you're going for those Olympics or Commonwealth Games scenarios. So, yeah, there certainly is a lot more pressure and there's a lot more online for them so certainly I think the more psychological training you can have how to cope under pressure for these situations uh, it, it is is the key is the key to, to achieving, achieving top level now yeah, yeah. Um, like you mentioned your coach and how big of a role do you think they played in like your success and how much do you think they helped you yeah for me uh, my coach Jeff Roxy was a uh, massive Absolutely massive for me. Um, he really built me up as a, as a person. I mentioned before that I was quite shy and, you know, I didn't have much confidence. And um, even if I do well in a competition, I, he used to say to me, you know, you would just say it's because everyone else messed up. You know, I never wanted to say it's because I did well. Um, so he, he, he was tough on me, but it was what I needed. And, uh, yeah, he, w 
it was tough in the sense that, you know, it, it was military. You had to go through brick walls if you want to be a good gymnast. But he would never let me leave the session feeling down about myself. Um, you know, he, he, <laughs> he could be upset with me because I haven't done something well in the session, but he'd always build me up before I left. And that was really important. And um, so that taught, um, taught me how to be tough on myself, but also not to take it home with me, you know. And um, he was great. He always, he always stood by me. And it's so important for a coach, you know. It, it, it's so difficult for a coach to say that. They have to give up probably even more time um, than we do as athletes. You know, we do our training and go home where, you know, it's a full-time job for them. So they'll have us to coach and then they'll have someone else. And to still make that time, my coach used to come in with me um, when, I was, when I had one day of school off a week. Um, I used to do uh, either a Tuesday or a Thursday. And uh, that was extra for him. So that was voluntary to try and uh, get, get me where I needed to go. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't thank him enough for everything that, um, that he put me through and he, he got me to achieve. Um, and then also I had a coach, um, Andre Popov, who's a national coach, and he travelled the world with me. Like um, those World Cups, Cups I mentioned before, where you went to different countries if you were qualified top eight in the world. And, and he was great. And he, he was from Russia. So his mentality was uh, a little bit different, but... Um, very much his expertise was amazing. So he had a lot of expertise, knowledge, and that really progressed my senior career. And, and without high-level coaches, and I'm noticing this now as, a, as a, being a coach, it's so important for them to, to get this experience and how to talk to gymnasts and, and how to get the best out of them. And um, I, can't, I can't stress that enough, really. You know, you, you could be high-level and experienced, but every athlete's different. Every person's different. Uh, so you need to be able to to be able to know how to how to spark them up as such and my coach Jeff especially was very good at getting me to uh, to do that so yeah interesting Rowan oh you did that's still me yeah last one what advice would you give to any young aspiring gymnast or the youth of today um <laughs> great question um I think for me just first of all just enjoy it you know it, I, I love gymnastics and there was times where I did want to quit because it was so hard and I used to just think to myself, well, why did I get started in this? Well, it's because I enjoyed it and it made me feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. So certainly that, that's the main thing. That's a priority and you can always look back on that as foundation when things are going hard. Um, also, don't beat yourself up. There's no point doing that. I've seen gymnasts so frustrated that they'll be hitting things in the gym, they'll be taking it home with them and, and ready to let it get to them, but it doesn't help. You know, it is very difficult to say, but once you're out of the gym, I think that's it. You know, you need to refresh. You need to find a distraction. Um, I have my friends. I love my PlayStation, things like that. Um, not thinking over and over about, you know, why, why a, a session's gone wrong. And, um, yeah, so having distractions, enjoying what you do, and perseverance is a massive one. Um, and it, it, honestly, like, there's been times where I thought, I'm never going to get this skill. Oh, I'm never going to beat this gymnast, but with perseverance, you can always do it. And it sounds cheesy, but have a dream. Like, you know, I, I didn't know I wanted to be an Olympian until maybe I was a senior, but I knew I wanted to be one of the best gymnasts ever. I, the way I was shy and not much confidence, I never thought that would be possible. But I guess with determination, a lot of good guidance, it, it, it's paid off. So I would say have a dream as well and, and just go for it. Don't listen to people that are being negative listen to people that are trying to help you and be positive so yeah those are my three points really try yeah. and uh, yeah, inspire and, yeah yeah uh, last question Dan if you were to choose any for dinner party guests who would it be and why and if you want to invite them to this beach party that you're having then you're more than welcome <laughs> <laughs> we'll change it for a bit I might have to change my answers if we're having a beach party <laughs> uh, so for me, I got a. Uh, you have you? <laughs> I like that. I had to prepare for this one. This is the only question I've prepared for. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so like I mentioned before, there's a gymnast Koei Ichimura. I would love to have him. Sat down and just uh, pick his brains on how he was able. I know I competed at a high level, but he was that extra level of, you know, putting his arm up and he's got to deliver a, a gold-winning routine and to to be Olympic champion, and he did it or world champion so many times. So to pick his brain and just to see what he went through and what he was thinking before them, I'd love to speak to him about. Also, there's a guy, I don't know if you know him, Joe Rogan. The Joe Rogan podcast. I've heard, I've heard. Yeah. Hi. This inspired me a little bit because this is a podcast. And uh, 
he, he's uh, really cool. If you listen to some of his YouTube stuff, he talks about everything. And I really like that. I like that someone can talk about uh, if it's politics, if it's sport, if it's uh, aliens, whatever. <laughs> just, you know, just being free-minded and just getting that, just having a talk and that. So it'd be really cool to talk to him. Yep. Uh, then someone either cooked the food. So I thought Gordon Ramsay, he seems to be a pretty good cook. As long as he's uh, not showing at anyone, I'd have him around. He seems like a laugh. And uh, then Billy Connolly, he's, uh, ah, he's cool. amazing. Scottish yeah. icon. And, uh, I love I love stand-up comedy. And I've loved watching his comedies over the years. So I think it would be hilarious to have a, a dinner party as well. So, yeah, I think uh, yeah, us five together, that would be a good, uh, <laughs> a good dinner party. Brilliant. Yeah. I don't know if Jason's out, Mr. Irvin. I don't know if Jason's got any last ones you want to ask, but I'm good. Oh, okay, okay Jason. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us tonight, Dan. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your great questions. And uh, best yeah. of luck to you guys. And best of luck to you, Jason. All the best. Hopefully, yeah. I'll see you at uh, Commonwealth Games or Olympics in the future. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh. Anybody watching this, make sure you get across to our uh, Spotify YouTube channels. Make sure you give us a follow on Twitter at Bishy PE. Uh, and here's to the next 25, Mr. McHugh. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, guys. Take care. Thank you, guys. Take care. See you later. Bye, guys.